Moderator, thank you. Um, just to keep the Assembly updated on proceedings, if you've been invited to the beating retreat and reception, then please note that the Palace have kept their eye on the weather forecast and it's atrocious. And therefore, the beating retreat element has had to be cancelled. So there are unfortunately no pipers, drummers or dancers on the forecourt of the Palace tomorrow. So do just arrive at 7pm or you'll be rather wet uh, when you finally get inside. Could I also just put out a plea to all commissioners and, and those in our public gallery to take out your phone and make sure it's on silent or vibrate mode. There are a number of phones going off, a number of notifications um, being heard, and it's really very distracting for everyone. In terms of our discussion and debate this afternoon, the Procedure Committee have decided to make an order of the day at 3.45 for Section 15. That's Presbytery Mission Planning, including the overtures from the Presbyteries of Glasgow and Lothian and Borders. When that's dealt with, we will then return to whoever we were before we moved to the order of day and make our way through the sections of deliverance as they appear in the order of proceedings. We will ensure that a comfort break happens at around half past three, and we will finish our business tonight by quarter past six to enable the Guild Big Sing to get in and get on. We are aware of time and the huge amount of business that is before us, and therefore I move to suspend Standing Order 95 in relation to the length of speeches, and propose that all speeches, except for those that are bringing overtures, are reduced to three minutes, and I require the assent of the Assembly to do so. Thank you, convener. I'm swapping out for two minutes to get a picture taken, uh, and I'll be back uh, in with you. So th thank you, <laughs> Susan. Nothing like being thrown in at the deep end when you can't actually see above. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're on section two, and we have some questions. Oh, we've got things here too. Excellent. We, we, we're on section two. We have a question from Jim Hamilton. Yes, uh, thank you, moderator. Uh, 217, uh, Jim Hamilton, Deacon at Maryhill uh, Rock Hill Church. Um, it was just to, yeah, to comment on it and say it was a fantastic report. Um, however, <laughs> I encourage the Education Schools Group on trying to hold the local authority representatives at the local authority table. In the west of Scotland, as LA reps, we stand together, Church of Scotland and Roman Catholics, and don't want a watered-down LA rep with no voting rights, where we may be seen as a pushover or not taken seriously, as humble as we are. We need to stand together and to remain at the table and building on our strong relationships. It says... Um, the statements are fine but, uh, from the committee, but they sit on the fence. Um, and it says in report 2374, while we are in the main untroubled by the removal of voting powers of church religious reps on LA Education Committee, the question is, will this not weaken our hand in local authority matters and filtering down to vital schools work? as well. Thank you. Thank you Moderator Jonathan Fleming, um, the convener of the Mission Support Programme Group and Vice Convener of FAPOLT. Thank you, Jim, for the question or for, the, uh, for your point. It was just to say um, what this proposal entails is not to um, reduce or water down 
the, the local authority representation. The situation at the moment is currently presbyteries are invited to suggest the names of people for the role of Church of Scotland representative for local authorities to Fafolt for them to then approve the name for it then to go back down. At the moment, what we're seeking to do is, as part of our devolve, devolution to presbyteries, is to allow the presbyteries to nominate a suitable person to act as a Church of Scotland local authority rep and to report to the presbytery. And then these nominations be directly passed from the presbytery to the local authority. That's what this is all about. Thank you. Thank you. We have um, Gary Peacock um, wanting to make a, a comment. Gary. Moderator, thank you. Uh, Gary Peacock, 104. Uh, I'd like to welcome this section of the report and commend uh, the Faith Action Programme leadership team for bringing it to the General Assembly today. In a former life, I served as a counsellor, and as I recall, the role of religious representatives in the education was one that was valued. At the time, there were also teachers' representatives from two of the various unions who served in the committee. Sometimes the religious representatives could be prophetic, telling the truth that those in political parties found it difficult or electorally inconvenient to utter. I regret the withdrawal of voting rights from religious representatives in some councils. This exploits a loophole in the legislation, and I can't believe that the 1973 Local Government Scotland Act was intended to be interpreted in this way. Be that as it may, I welcome the report's ecumenical aspect in stating that we stand with our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters in recognising the special place their church has in education in Scotland. My own children attend a Roman Catholic secondary, and I greatly value the Christian ethos of this school. The underlying trajectory, of course, is one which ignores our history. The Church of Scotland's role in education in Scotland, a school in every parish, and the rightful desire of the Catholic community for the same standard of education for their children. While democracy is cited as the reason for the withdrawal of voting rights, there is undoubtedly an agenda by some to remove the church from the sphere of education. I have two schools in my parish, and I'm privileged to go into them at Christmas, Easter, Pentecost, etc. I'm not there to proselytize, but to inform and to allow children to grow in knowledge and experience while being sensitive to their background. I would urge the team to remain vigilant on this matter and to work with other churches in Scotland and indeed other faith groups to ensure that a religious observance, school chaplaincy, and the provision of religious and moral education in schools continues. A completely secular education system and a lack of religious and moral education is not a neutral position, as some would claim, but rather a value judgment in itself. It risks leaving our children ignorant rather than well-informed and so able to exercise their own judgment as we would wish. We may be fortunate that these issues are probably too hot a potato for any Scottish government to tackle, but there will in the coming years be pressure on them to do so. So let's stand with our ecumenical partners and make the case that a Christian faith has a place in a plural and diverse Scotland, not least in the education of our young people. Thank you. I'd like to ask I'd like to ask Hugh Stewart to speak now. Online. Thank you. Jings, I need a haircut. <laughs> Hello. Fisco <laughs> Matt Moderator. Uh, good afternoon, moderators. I would like to um, just bring a wee bit of encouragement to the Assembly and thank the Assembly very much for their support of Gaelic Ministry and Mission. And in an amazing way. The Church of Scotland is actually ahead of the, the curve in relation to this. The census came out today to show that uh, Gaelic has increased in schools across Scotland, but in the native communities, uh, it hasn't accelerated to the same extent. The Church of Scotland, a year last December, entered into uh, an innovative uh, Something's come up on my screen here. Yeah, can you give uh, me what language I'm speaking? 
um, just cancel it. Um, can you, can and the Lego project can you give began. Us your name and, and number. Oh, sorry. sorry. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thanks. Uh, Hugh, sorry, Hugh Stewart, four five five. I'm sorry about that. Um, I was just wanted to encourage the assembly. Thank you very much for your support of Garrick Ministry and Mission. Uh, in front of me here, I don't know. Can you see that? You can see a wee bit of it. That's the Gaelic Kiddies Bible, and over a thousand of these Bibles have been requested across Scotland from parents, from children, from uncles, from schools, and from churches. Uh, an encouragement to us that there is a hunger and a thirst across Scotland to hear about Jesus. The resources are intergenerational. Granny, Grandpa, Brother, Sister, can read the books, the Bibles with their children or listen to the QR code. So it's up there in terms of technology as well. There's another six Lego animation videos coming out uh, this year. And we've been greatly encouraged uh, with working with the receipt of some of these by um, just across Scotland, by parents, by schools, by uh, ministers. And we're developing, or the, uh, those supporting the projects are developing pupil pages and teachers resources to accompany this. So not only will it be available in churches, in homes, intergenerationally, but in our schools, because Jesus loves the children of Scotland, and I'm fully persuaded he wants to bless them. Suffer the little children to come unto me, he said, of such is the kingdom of heaven. And the collateral benefit is that although these resources are being produced in Gaelic, they're also being translated into English. So the English children also have access to these resources and they've been provided free to any child in Scotland. And finally, there's an international project where we're liaising with um, Nova Scotia. So the children of Scotland will be dialoguing with the children of Nova Scotia and other nations about Jesus. And we're very thankful to other churches also who have encouraged the receipt of the Gaelic Story Bible. We're thankful to the Free Church, the United Free Church, to the Roman Catholic Church, and to independent churches across Scotland. And I'd like to thank particularly Leslie Hamilton Messer, Robert uh, Rawson and David Williams and the grant team in 121. They do a fantastic work. Let's pray for the children. And I close with the final request that I got this week for the Gaelic Kiddies Bible. It's slightly north of a new moderator. It's in Alaska. So the Bibles have enriched Alaska, a feat that was unintended, but very welcome. Thank you, moderator. Thank can I say, um, in the interest of trying to keep business moving, it would be good if you could remember the phrase of 2018, which was kiss. Keep it short for Susan. <laughs> okay, if you can remember that, and I mean, we're, we're looking at incredibly important things, but if, if you can say it as concisely as you can, it will help us to keep the business moving and make sure that everybody gets a fair crack at the whip. Are you happy with that? Thank you. Do we move now to section two? Oh, we've, we have one more speaker. Um, kiss David Burt. <laughs> oh, David, thank you. Moderator Burt, David Burt 140. I'm actually one of the representatives on Inverclyde Council representing Church of Scotland. And quite ironically, I'm missing the meeting this afternoon of my local authority education committee. Two quick points. One, on the basis of voting rights, the, the voting rights are important, but they're not the be all and end all. The key thing is that there's still church representation on the committees. And that is the key thing for us, that we're actually the voices being heard and being there. And that's more important than whether or not we vote or not. Indeed, you can make a strong argument that taking away the voting rights dulls the arguments of those who would seek to remove the, education, the, the religious representatives from the education committees completely. 
And there's a very strong campaign of that, particularly from the Scottish Humanist Society. I'm lucky the Inverclay, Inverclay Council was petitioned by, um, by, the, by the Humanist Society to remove all religious representatives, and they resoundingly said, no, that wasn't going to happen, and we remain, retain our voting rights. Secondly, it's just to commend the committee and the work that they do for the, the active work that's got the people, the, the representatives coming together, meeting together, sharing together in person and online, both as Church of Scotland and interdenominationally. It's behind the scenes, but a lot of work's going on so that, we're, that we know what each other's doing in different councils. It's been a fantastic move and it should be encouraged. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, David. Thank you. Can we move now to section two? Do they set, does they? Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, yeah, sorry. I was going to ask for the hall first. Hall first. And online. Excellent. Um, and I have to say, the, the, the kiss works for Shaw as well. <laughs> now... I'll let uh, someone else explain that to him. <laughs> <laughs> what happened in my absence? <laughs> I go out for two minutes of a picture. I need to give you a talk. Whoa. Is there money involved? No. no. We're, we're section three in the print. Section three in the print. Okay. Have we dealt with a new section? Well, section three in the print is a same we're happy to agree. Thank you. And online? Right, we've got an explanation of a new section. Uh, new section four, the Reverend Mary. And I'll read it. Oh, you'll read it? I didn't even get to a surname. It's <laughs> 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 okay, Clark. <laughs> Reverend Mary. Brengen, is that how I pronounce? I'm telling Brengen. Brengen, right. Fantastic. Thank you. Oh. So we have a new section for in Barry Bringen's name, encourage FAPALT in relation to the basic level for locum remuneration to consider moving towards benchmarking this against the real living wage rather than the national minimum wage. Thank you, moderator. Thank you. And you wish to speak to your section, please. Yes, Barry Bringen, 139. Moderator, I've recently finished serving as a locum for five years when a new minister was ordained and inducted just last month. So it's some really good news. I'm pleased that the local remuneration for pastoral care has been increased to the minimum wage. However, I am disappointed that the locum hourly remuneration has not been raised to at least that of the real living wage. And I would encourage FAPLT to take this on board. I realize that this will have financial implications for the church either locally or nationally, but I believe that it is the right thing to do. As the General Assembly of 2012 instructed that staff be paid the real living wage by 2015. So I would encourage FAPLT in relation to this to consider moving towards benchmarking this against the real living wage. All right, um, is this seconded? Yes. Okay, can the convener just give me an indication? This isn't closing a bit, it's just an indication whether you're going to accept or whether we go to debate. Yes. Um, does anyone else in the Assembly wish to make comment in the way that the committee is happy to agree, or can we just simply put it to the Assembly? Happy to put this to the Assembly? All right. Yes, that's fine, please. I will observe the KISS principal moderator. <laughs> Happy to accept this. I now this. know what that means, Angus, fortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Matheson, 14. Uh, happy to accept this. Mary, you and I go back to candidates' conferences years ago, but we don't want to go back too far in history. We'd be happy to accept it. It will be an impact on congregations' income for those who are in receipt of a vacancy allowance. We're currently paying 363 congregations a vacancy allowance amounting to £4 million a year. There's also an additional amount where we pay a vacancy allowance for ministers who are off sick, that's a central cost, or ministers who are on administrative suspension. And again, that's a central cost. But we're happy to consider it and take it away to explore. Thanks, Mary. 
Thank you. So, same way, happy to agree, and then online. Yep, thank you. Um, so that's the new section. We now move to section four, as is in the print, which is adopting the terms of responsibility for minister serving, uh, and so on. Um, I have got intimation of a couple of questions. Firstly, Sarah Ross, and then Hazel Hasty. Sarah's up here. That's yours. Thank you, moderator. Uh, Sarah Ross, 235. Um, <clears throat> my question is, please can you give the General Assembly more information on when you see a capability process actually coming? In 2022, proposals of content were given and we're now told proposals will be given in 2025, which is not the same as a process, uh, which has already been significantly delayed. Planning has certainly highlighted the differences in capability and as much as I feel ministers have not been treated fairly, I believe it is a disservice to all ministers to not have this in place. My hope is it builds up capability, but also deals with those who are not fulfilling their vows. I appreciate that this may seem harsh, but I actually believe team ministry in particular will need this with some urgency. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Hazel. Oh, it's a question, sorry, can you hear? Or, Angus. <laughs> <laughs> a nice, easy first name, moderator. Matheson 14, we are working with some pace to bring the material to the Assembly of 2025. I want to offer the apologies of the Faith Nurture Forum and now the Faith Action Leadership Programme Team for the delay in this long-standing members of this assembly uh, looking at Dr Browning in particular will remember that this came out of a commission on tenure and leadership in the local church some 10 years ago at least uh, so again I just want to reiterate that apology and we will be bringing material next year that will also dovetail with the information that is contained in presbytery mission plans with the mission narrative about the Presbytery's hopes for what it seeks to achieve in a particular area, as well as reinforcing and emphasizing the place of local church review. They are all of a piece together in seeking to be the best that God wishes us to be in serving the mission of Jesus Christ in the local church. My apologies to the assembly again, and we are definitely bringing something next year. Thank you, Sarah. Right, Hazel. Thank you, moderator. Um, Hazel Hasty, number 33. Um, my question relates to assistant ministers. Um, I wonder, could the convener please give further clarity on the review of assistant ministers' contracts? Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Matheson. <laughs> Angus Matheson, number 14. Happy to respond to that. I, I think there's a whole range of issues arising from your question, Dr. Hasty. I'd want to first of all confirm that the letter that was issued to interim ministers stating that the scheme would end in September 2025 is the definitive document. The assistant minister scheme was offered as a bridging scheme in response to the instruction of the 2021 General Assembly. And the Faith Action Programme leadership team commits to keeping that scheme under review. I'm delighted to report that the only outstanding presbytery mission plans for people for whom this is the first time at the General Assembly, the Assistant Minister Scheme was introduced in the light of the sisting, suspending of congregations being allowed to call while presbytery mission plans were being put together. The only outstanding mission plans that we're waiting for as a church are from the Presbytery of Lewis and for the areas covered by the former Presbyteries of Caithness and Uist, now part of Clare L&E. Uh, sorry, Hugh and Rory, that's the extent of my Gaelic. <laughs> I'm delighted to report too that at its meeting on Friday of last week, the Faith Action Programme leadership team approved the mission plan for the Presbytery of Forth Valley and Clydesdale. <laughs> and 
once that goes through the meeting of presbytery on the 1st of June, that should result in a number of vacancies coming through. The contracts that our assistant ministers are on will vary, but we are renewing them where a presbytery sees it as a good thing to happen, where the presbytery feels that it's appropriate at this point in time for a period of six months. However, there will be situations where presbyteries are committed to allowing congregations permission to call, and it will be a presbytery decision that some instances will mean that vacancies will proceed as a priority, and we'll look at redeploying assistant ministers within that presbytery or elsewhere some folk are willing to travel to other presbyteries. Our forecasting is that the vacancies that are coming through over the coming next to three years or so will match the supply of candidates, and we rejoice in that. Of the current vacancies on the Church of Scotland website, nine of them, moderator, nine of them have a minister who has preached and been elected as nominee, or who is about to preach as a nominee and hopefully be elected and accept the call. And of those nine, five are on assistant minister contracts. So that's the majority of those nine. The Faith Action Programme leadership team has a duty of care to those who are on assistant minister contracts. We will keep those under review. And equally, we have a duty of care to the congregations in those presbyteries where bases of adjustment have been agreed and where they look to go ahead to call a minister. We'll keep the scheme under review. It is only financially possible because vacancies were assisted. I quoted the number of vacancy allowances earlier, but we recognize the anxieties that people are experiencing and we will journey with them and offer appropriate pastoral care and support. But it is a bridging scheme. If presbyteries feel that the roles of these assistant ministers are ones that it wants to continue into the future, that's a conversation about mainlining these into presbytery mission plans and the Faith Action Programme leadership team, depending on what happens later today, looks forward to continuing exciting conversations about creative new forms of ministry. Thank you, moderator. Thank you. I notice if I, oh, any other questions before I move to, to comments? There's none on the screen, so and nothing on coming through online. Um, so Timothy Sinclair. Sinclair, 179. Uh, moderator, I want to thank the committee for the report uh, and draw attention to appendix number two, where I was glad to see uh, in full the vows of ordination and induction. I always find it humbling, uh, very challenging and clarifying to hear the vows that I took myself uh, back in 2018. And I want to draw attention to the final vow, which says, do you promise through grace to study to approve yourself a faithful minister of the gospel among this people? Now, in my attempts to honor that vow that I made, I find all sorts of obstacles, uh, primarily the, the tyranny of the immediate, uh, often the tyranny of the inbox, and all the pressures of family life, church life, and presbytery business. And I know for me personally, the task of studying uh, and reflecting on God's word and engaging with some of the difficult questions that we were thinking about yesterday is a bit like pumping air into a punctured tire. Uh, if I'm not going forward, I'm not just standing still, I'm going backwards. Uh, and so I'm very grateful for the resources that are uh, available uh, through Ascend to make it possible uh, to have time. Time, there's funding as well, but especially time uh, for con concentrated study uh, and reflection. Uh, my own experience of the study leave scheme in particular was very positive. Uh, I was supported by my congregation and my Kirk session uh, and uh, neighboring colleagues who made themselves available to make that a reality for me. But I'm aware in my own presbytery that the take up of the scheme is uh, very low. And I think that's not because individual ministers don't have the desire or see the necessity of study but simply the prospect of taking study leave seems increasingly implausible. 
because of the pressures that they are working under, often in their own parish, but also doubling up as an interim moderator uh, or as a, a committee convener, feeling the lack of uh, cover, seeing the lack of precedent, and that being modelled. So I'd really like to extend a challenge, not primarily to ministers, but perhaps especially to elders as they go back to their Kirk sessions, to encourage ministers uh, to feel that it is plausible, as well as being necessary and desirable, uh, to take advantage of the excellent resources that are available uh, and funded through uh, Ascend. Thank you. Another question has come in in the name of Douglas Reed. Thank you, moderator. Douglas Reed, 20, and I'd like to declare an interest that I am currently on what um, one of the assistant minister contracts. I just wanted on behalf of my cohort to check with the uh, committee that they understand that there's a great deal of anger amongst the cohort and there is a great number within the cohort currently on assistant minister contracts who feel that they may have to look at options for employment out with the Church of Scotland, thereby losing a significant number of the candidates that we so desperately need to bring God's word to the people of Scotland. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Moderator uh, McNeil 454. Um, thank you for the statement, for the question, and we, we do recognise um, that you're in, our assistant ministers are in a very uncertain season. We're, we're hard sore uh, for what you're trying to navigate and find your way through. Uh, however, our hope is genuinely with us now reaching the stage of implementation of the mission planning, that a number of vacancies are going to open up and that over the course of the next few months that there'll be the opportunities, a lot more opportunities for you to apply for vacant churches. Um, we, we do assure you of our ongoing journey with you, our ongoing prayerful support, and as has already been alluded to, uh, we'll continue to journey with you um, and come alongside you and support you as best we can. Thank you. All right, there's no other indications to speak, so I then put section four to the assembly. And online. We have indication of two new sections come up. Firstly, uh, we'll take um, one, uh, Dr. John Ferguson, uh, and thereafter we'll take the next new section, uh, Ben Thorp. So firstly, Dr. John Ferguson. Thank you, moderator. John Ferguson, 301. Moderator, my... Uh, reasons for proposing this new section come from my experience as a presbytery clerk in seeking to offer support to ministers in presbytery. I'm very much aware that ministers in their first charges can face particular challenges, and no matter how good our training might be when the reality of being in your first charge hits home, it can indeed be very challenging for all sorts of reasons. Moderator, I understand that eight ministers have left the ministry in their first five years, from 2021 to 2024 inclusive. And this has to be a cause for deep regret for our church. Of course, sometimes there will be situations where no matter how good the support might be, people will leave the ministry. But we should always be seeking ways of supporting ministers more effectively. And that can ensure ministers in their early stages have a mentor, for example, or as we've done in the Presbytery of Perth, we've brought ministers in their first five years together just to meet up and share stories. I'm also conscious of the excellent work that the ministry's team at 121 are doing via Ascend that was mentioned a few moments ago. And I appreciate that ministers in their first five years can use the Continuing Ministerial Development Fund but what I'm proposing is to seek an improvement on that. Ministers in the first five years cannot access study leave, and I don't think really that makes sense. What I'm proposing isn't study leave for ministers in their first five years. What I'm proposing instead is a scheme whereby ministers in their first five years could utilize a scheme whereby they have two weeks study leave on a use it or lose it basis. So it doesn't mean they can build up 
in terms of banking um, time and funding. But I'm also suggesting that there should be an increase in the amount of funding available to put them on the same level as ministers with five or more year service. I'm not clear why ministers, because they're in their first five years, should have less of an allowance than ministers who have done more than five years. The new section also, again, um, ties into what the speaker a few moments ago was saying in terms of reminding congregations of the need to support their ministers in their first five years, encouraging them to make use of what's on offer for them, and in facilitating, ensuring that there is no sense of guilt about taking study leave. We need to facilitate it. We need to provide not just study leave, but also within that scheme, retreats as well for ministers in their first five years. Moderator, I so move. Okay, is this seconded? Okay, um, I've got information, I think Fiona Lister, are you wishing to speak in this new section five? Yep, if you'd like to speak. Thank you, moderator. Fiona Lister, 362. Um, I just want to thank John for bringing this issue forward on behalf of those of us in our first five years. Um, at present, we have jumped into situations which are unprecedented, which we were not altogether trained for. In fact, I think most people here were not trained for who knew that buildings was so big a part of ministry. <laughs> Our more experienced colleagues are also dealing with so many logistical changes which have had to occur within the church, as well as the normal pastoral work and other things. I have very much appreciated the support and answering of daft questions from some of my more experienced colleagues, but I am aware that their capacity is limited. I think it's really important that we are assigned a men mentor and have the opportunity to meet together uh, to discuss our various challenges. To have the appropriate stud study leave available to explore issues which have been thrown up, particularly during the first years, once we actually know which questions we need to ask, we'd be gratefully received, as well as having time to access some of the training and uh, study which has been uh, made available to us. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak on this new section? If not, John, do you wish to say any more? No, then I ask the committee. Moderator Wishart, 24. On a personal note, we obviously started in Hamilton Presbytery around about the same time if they could see us now. <laughs> Can I thank Dr. Ferguson for this motion? And um, in spirit, we would like to accept it. It comes down to our old friend of money. Um, let me just explain. Well, we welcome the introduction of a period of time to take in the first five years, two weeks perhaps being the minimum of continuing personal development we would hope that first five-year ministers would take. We already invest central monies in courses like Leadership Course, Place for Hope training, and we have things planned like balcony days, retreats, etc. And an allocation of study leave time will require increased budget for pulpit supply, which we think we can manage. Additional monies, however, would be a real challenge but we will look at the balance of pre-arranged training and monies to enable these things to take place. Martin Fair gives a large amount of his time to ministers in first five years and to helping presbyteries support their people. Please pray for our new ministers, particularly in these difficult times. And we've heard a lot already about assistant ministers and we, we cherish them and we are doing what we can but a reminder that they are entitled to first five-year funding if they are ordained. Otherwise, their full five years of funding will be held for them post-ordination. Thank you, moderator. Right, I put this new section into the Assembly. Um, is the Assembly happy to accept? The committee is happy to accept. Is the Assembly happy to accept? And online. Okay, thank you.
Um, don't worry about the numbering, but we're now at another new section, <laughs> five, uh, in the name of Ben Thorpe. Yes, please, Thorpe. So I thought I'd read this one out. Um, so we have a new section five in the name of Ben Thorpe. Instruct the Faith Action Programme leadership team and the other relevant parties recognising the pace of societal change at this time, acknowledging the significance of the recently released CAST report and informed by the work done by the Theological Forum on Transgender Identities to consider the implications of the CAST report to the work of the church, particularly amongst young people and report to a future assembly. Okay, Ben, please speak. That's you. Thank you, moderator. Uh, ben Thorpe, 181. Uh, yesterday, we received the report of the Theological Forum, including essential work on understanding the theological implications of transgender identity. There was also a section of the report covering conversion therapy, which has been discussed at previous assemblies. In 2022, the General Assembly uh, approved the endorsement via the Faith Impact Forum of the Memorandum of Understanding on Conversion Therapy in the UK, which is mentioned in section 4.4 of the Theological Forum's report. On April 10th this year, the Independent Review of Gender Identity Services for Children and Young People, more commonly known as the CAS Review or the CAS Report, was released. This review, which took four years to prepare has caused many individuals and organizations to reassess their practice when it comes to working with children and young people experiencing gender identity related issues. It has also called into question many of the previously accepted practices and has led some organizations to withdraw their endorsement of the aforementioned memorandum of understanding. Uh, this deliverance is simply asking that the church engages fully with this important new piece of research as we consider how best we can serve and minister to those in the transgender community, particularly the increasing numbers of children and young people who are seeking care for gender identity issues. These are important issues. As highlighted by Alison McBriar yesterday, they are issues that have led some to permanently life-altering chemical and surgical solutions, some of which are now being questioned by the medical community. We are mostly not medics, or therapists, but it is our duty of care as shepherds of the flock to be as well informed as possible in the care that we do provide. I so move the deliverance. Thank you. Is that seconded? Thank you. Any questions? I've got notice of one comment, but any questions first of all? No, can I move to comment? Um, Philip Wright, online. Thank you, moderator, right, 184. Moderator, I'd like to speak in support of this new section. It was good to read and to hear yesterday of the work of the Theological Forum on Transgender Identities. I thank the forum for its work. I hear what the forum said then regarding the scope of their work being primarily theological and not medical or scientific. As it says on its cover, the CAST review is an independent review of gender identity services for children and young people. It is a medical and scientific review, but it is written with a wider audience in mind. It is a hugely substantial piece of work. The committee reviewed 237 papers. These included 113,269 children from 18 countries. The CAST review notes that young people, I quote, young people's sense of identity is not always fixed and may evolve over time. One of its key recommendations is that all children and young people refer to NHS gender services are screened for neurodevelopmental conditions, including autism spectrum disorder and a mental health assessment. But it notes that this is, and again I quote, in a context of an NHS service unable to cope with demand. Here in Scotland, many will know that waiting times for children and adolescent mental health services are years long in many cases. The CAST report notes that at its heart are vulnerable children and young people. These vulnerable children and young people must surely also be at the church's heart. I would 
urge Assembly to instruct FAPLT and other relevant parties as this new section proposes to acknowledge the significance of the CAS report and consider its implications for the work of the church and to do so as it is informed by the work of the Theological Forum on Transgender Identities. I support this new section and encourage the Assembly to also do so. Thank you. Thank you. No one else wishes to speak? Ben, do you wish to say anything before I ask the, the, the committee to close the debate? Uh, ben Thorpe, 181. Um, thank you for uh, Philip's comments. And just again, I urge you, this is an important matter. It's not a question uh, of uh, side. It's a question of actually the work we do with children and young people um, and the potential harm that could be how it could have been done and has been done in some cases uh, to children and young people. Um, and if this were any other situation, we would want to be taking it very seriously. I suggest we do so by, uh, by investigating fully the results of this um, substantial review. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Committee. Moderator Jonathan Fleming, convener of the Mission Support Programme Group um, and vice convener of FAPLT. Um, thank you to Ben for this motion. Um, we are happy to accept, um, and just to give you an idea that if it was agreeable to the General Assembly, that what would happen is the Public Life and Social Justice in collaboration with the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Group would work together in preparing a briefing for FAPLT, and then for the young people element of it, the Mission Support Programme Group would work with those who are tasked with working with children and young people to take this work further and to bring it back as requested. Thank you. Thank you, moderator. Thank you. So we've heard that the committee are prepared to accept this new section. Is the General Assembly willing to accept a new section? And online. Right. Thank you. Now, is there another new section? Grant Barclay, do you wish to, to read it, Clark? Thank you. Hello. Right. Thank you, moderator. Um, this is another new section five. Don't worry. As we said earlier, we sort the numbers out. Um, and this is in the name of uh, Reverend Grant Barclay, and I'll read it as follows. Instruct the Faith Action Programme Leadership Team in consultation with the Assembly Trustees to review the report, which may be provided to those ministers from overseas who have completed their familiarisation periods and presently seek a charge with the administrative and financial challenges of renewing visas and report to the General Assembly of 2025 and in the interim supply any support which may be provided without budgetary implications. Thank you. Right. Grant. Grant Barclay, 163, moderator and Presbytery Clark in Glasgow and therefore line manager to some ministers from overseas who have now completed their familiarisation periods. They seek a charge they ordinarily might have expected by now to have secured one, but that hasn't happened. And so some of them need to renew their visas before they have been inducted. Visa renewal has recently become much more costly. For example, a minister with a spouse and two children needs to pay, I understand, visa and healthcare surcharge fees of nearly £16,000. Now, I'm unclear whether the church does or whether indeed it can offer any help, and I am not seeking to spend any money which is earmarked for use elsewhere. I know my standing order 56. However, I am aware that grants mm -hmm. and loans may sometimes be made available for a range of purposes, sometimes from appropriate restricted funds, and I wonder if Faith Action might explore assisting, mm -hmm. perhaps with advice or possibly with financial resource, those who are renewing visas who have not as yet secured a charge. My motion requires FAPALT to review the situation without waiting until the next assembly and take steps which are both appropriate and feasible so that speedy progress might be made and then report to next year's assembly. I'm not seeking any particular action and I'm not requiring any expenditure, but I do think that there might be much to be gained to help those who find themselves caught in this particular rather expensive and perhaps unforeseen problem. And I hope that this might be acceptable to the convener and the assembly. And I have arranged for a seconder. Seconded. Thank you. Uh, I've only got one note of a comment. Any questions, first of all? 
If not, any comment uh, is Evaristo Muzenda. Please correct me, my pronunciation, please. Thank you, moderator Evaristo Museza 419. I arrived in Scotland 2021, and I used 19,000 pounds for myself and my family to get here. And I went through the familiarization process, and I'm glad I'm in a charge. Uh, 11 months into the charge, I'm loving it, I'm excited. In July, I'm needing 14,000 to renew the visas for myself and my family. And I want to be clear, the Church of Scotland is very explicit and clear in telling you what you need to do and what, you need, um, what is needed before you arrive here. And I just want to support what Grant is saying just now to say, it's not as if it's news to us when we get here. We are told this is your baby, if I may put it that way. But I also wanted to bring and highlight the predicament that many of us find ourselves in, but especially colleagues that are yet to find charges, some of whom have been applying just now, and I know of colleagues that have applied for any other vacant charge that is in there, and some, again, being told, you know, you don't have the experience or what, and again, the context, but it's just a plea or an advocation to just say, the church loves us and I love being a part of here, but there is also the circumstances that constantly are changing. And when the government said uh, they are raising the same charges for the health uh, people, of, uh, foreigners that come into the country, it's the likes of myself whom I'm also paying my tax, and that increase means an increase in the fees that we are paying. But it's just one of those um, difficult conversations that we might have to say, in as much as we are aware that this is the financial implication we have, it also calls to say perhaps there could be other ways of supporting ministers that are coming in, into the country to also be a part of the church. And the other exciting part or difficult part is when the church says, you are all welcome, all are welcome, sometimes you might feel as if you are welcome, but just to this extent, figure out the rest. So it's just one of those things. Thank you, moderator. Okay. We'll go to another comment. Uh, John Pizzuto Pomico. This is on. That's you. You're on. Thank you. Um, my name is John Pizzuto Pomaco, uh, number 554. Um, some of you may be aware of um, who I am. Um, I have my, <laughs> my, uh, my mother uh, also is a minister, uh, and I'll tell you a bit about our story very quickly. I know it's a time limit, but um, yeah, we moved to Scotland a few years ago. Um, after, as an entire family, we felt a call to, um, to, 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 make, to, to do ministry here um, for God, and uh, you know that wasn't an easy decision. Um, you know, uh, we grew up there, and my, my you know family's been connected in uh, America for 50 years. Um, and so we had to move and leave our friends behind, um, our support network um, behind, start anew. Uh, but we did this because we really felt called to this country uh, and uh, to this people and to, to spread the gospel and the good news um, to Scotland. Um, so that's why we came. And, you know, we ha yeah, we have given up a lot um, to come. And I think that, that needs to be recognized, uh, not just us, but um, all the other ministers who are coming uh, from other countries. Uh, and giving up their livelihoods uh, and their uh, experiences uh, to to help, uh, and so yeah, just to say that we'd be grateful for any support that um, the committee can give and think about giving. We strongly recommend that, um, in some at least in some capacity, not even financially, but just with um, support uh, for you know mi uh, families that are coming. Uh, you know, uh, they have it, it, it's emotionally, emotionally as well. Um, you know, you're you're leaving your fr your family and your friends behind coming to your country, um, and so any support would be appreciated. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. If no one else wishes to speak on this section, uh, Grant, do you wish to 
respond. No, that's fine. Committee. Matheson, number 14. Uh, Grant, I'm grateful to you for your recognition of the challenges of standing under 56 and that you, what you're asking comes without budgetary implication. I just want to draw Commissioner's attendance to the fact that the health surcharge that our friends, colleagues, partners, brothers and sisters from abroad, the health, immigration health surcharge that they are required to pay was increased at the tail end of the year from, by a factor of 60%. We recognise the sacrifice that people make to come into ministry. We recognise that people do their arithmetic and work it out with the best of intentions. But when you're hit with a 60% increase from £624 for an adult to £1,035 per adult member of a household, that just throws all those calculations out the window. And that's an absolute tragedy. I also want to recognise some of the comments that John Pizzuto-Pomaco was making. John, I love your student journalism up in Aberdeen. Thank you for that. Uh, Josh. Oh, it's your brother. A talented family. <laughs> but I also want to recognise the challenges that are placed on adult members of the families with the salary levels that are being imposed on them and what they're expected to earn at the moment. We will work on this. Our public life and social justice team will also keep this under review as part of their remit. But I'd also encourage commissioners and presbyteries to engage with members of parliament to ensure that our immigration policy in the UK becomes, please, a bit more humane. I'm happy to accept it and to look at the issues and to offer that support. Could I please ask the convener of FAPORT to accept it? Angus, we appreciate your expertise and advice, but as a member of staff, it is not, or not a member of the, of the assembly, it needs to be the convener. Thank you. Moderator McNeil 454, thank you the principal clerk for that guidance and uh, we're more than happy to accept uh, this deliverance. Thank you. Okay, the convener has indicated that you will accept on behalf of the committee. Is it the mind of the assembly uh, that we accept this? And online. Oh, thank you. Section five in the print. It's not usual the committee makes a comment. You this is the Carry on, Jonathan. Thank you, moderator. Jonathan Fleming, convener of mission support. Um, just at this moment in time, could I perhaps, on behalf of uh, FAPL, extend our grateful thanks to the Hemdary Trust for their very generous support um, of several thousand pounds, approximately 30,000 pounds, to the work of our new Hemdary supplement, God Welcomes All. You'll be very pleased to hear that it had already sold out as of this morning at St Andrews um, at, the, at the store um, uh, here in the, the halls. I'm uh, reliably informed that more were coming today or they're very soon to be here, so you can get your fix before you go home. Um, but obviously this is just testament to the success of Sunday night where, over, where approximately 400 people were in attendance at the launch. And our grateful thanks go to all who made that the success it was. And we are very grateful that the Hymnary Trust funding will allow for the digital element of this rollout to take place and for the roadshows um, at presbytery level and beyond to allow people to join in this magnificent contribution to the music and worship of our church. Thank you, moderator. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, so we have we approved section five. Yeah, we had. Um, on so I've got amendments to section six uh, that are here. Um, so we're going, the clerk's wishing to speak to them before, or, and we'll need to hear them read out as well, uh, and then we'll go through the, the business. Thank you, thank you, moderator. We've got. got on, oh, I'm now on. Oh. That's a bit wobbly. Um, thank you, moderator. So we have got an amendment in the name of the convener, Tommy McNeil, to section six in the print. Okay, and I will read out the amendment, and that's what we're dealing with first. So this is an amendment 
in the name of the convener. It's amend section six by deleting the words to conduct research, including consultations with presbyteries into. So that bit's being deleted. And instead to substitute the following words to consult with presbyteries, readers and local worship leaders about, but the rest of that's in the print. I hope that makes sense to the assembly. <clears throat> just to remind the assembly, we have two amendments. So what we're going to be discussing just now is the amendments, and we'll get that sorted, and then we'll have a final version uh, of a section which we'll then put to you uh, for approval. Um, Tommy, do you wish to speak to, to your amendment? Moderator McNeil 454, I'm um, going to appeal to former moderator Chris and um, make this very brief and that this is simply about taking a lighter collaborative approach to a piece of work. Um, so it'll just mean that we'll be able to do it succinctly uh, and be able to, to get it done um, in a timious manner. So that's the reason and the thinking behind uh, making the amendment. Okay, is the amendment seconded? Thank you. Anyone wishing to speak on this amendment? If not, are the ha are, are, is the Assembly happy to accept the, the amendment? And online. Thank you. Uh, and then we move to an amendment in the name of Mr. Ian Murphy. And Clark, would you like to, to read this amendment, please? Thank you, moderator. So this is the second amendment in the name of Mr. Ian Murphy. Amend section six by adding at the end and in the interim, encourage presbyteries to promote the use of readers already set apart and willing to serve. Thank you. Mr. Murphy, do you wish to speak on this? Yep. Moderator Ian Murphy, 124. Um, it's really quite simple. Readers have spent a lot of time studying, getting prepared, being set apart. I've been a reader for 32 years. Um, and in some places, readers are not used. And we don't like being the appendix and the body, uh, just <laughs> there to be cut off. Um, so I would ask Pres the Assembly to support this amendment. Thank you. Are we a seconder? Thank you. Anyone, any discussion, questions or comments? There's none on the screen. That might be one coming in by phone. <laughs> um, no need to come back to you because we've had no discussion uh, in it. So, um, convener. Uh, moderator McNeil 454, um, thank you so much for bringing this to our attention. Very, very happy to receive this and at the same time uh, commend and sincerely thank our readers for the absolutely crucial role that they fulfil in the ministry expression of our church throughout our land. So, so thank you to our readers and very happy to encourage a greater use of them and to be blessed through their service. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is the Assembly happy to accept this amendment uh, to section six and online? Thank you. Uh, now, we then put the amended section six uh, to the Assembly. Oh. Um, so we've got um, Derek Browning, first of all, question. Moderator, thank you. I hope this is the right place for this question. It's a general question about readership. Um, in the President of Edinburgh West Lothian, we asked recently about training for readers. We have one new reader who was feeling the need for training, yeah. and others maybe would benefit from, from further training. When we contacted um, the central offices, we were told that training wasn't possible because of fewer staff and no resources. Uh, and so I'm a little bit confused as to that information, which was certainly only a couple of weeks, even a month or so ago, um, to what I'm now delightedly reading in, in the Blue Book, which doesn't seem to literally add up. Um, so which is it, moderator? Are there resources, are there staff members to organize the training of our readers, who I know would value and rejoice in this, um, or is it what we were told by uh, an official um, from, I must call it FAPOLT and not FATLIP, um, <laughs> FAPOLT, <laughs> um, 
to say that it wasn't simply possible because they had neither the resources nor the people. And I would sure the whole assembly would be grateful for clarification on this matter, as will the readers themselves. Well, thank you. Give you that. Moderator McNeil 454, thank you, Dr. Browning, for your very helpful question. Um, and the, we're in the process of prioritization exercise where we're trying to discern what the priorities of the church are. And so for Church of Scotland Learning, we genuinely want to hear what are the needs out there so that that can be fed into us so that we will then shape the different courses. So we're sorry for, for this moment that that particular course wasn't available, but we will endeavour to respond to that because we want to encourage more readers and we want to encourage more in our family of ministries. So, um, and yeah, so, and, and yeah, if you can feed that to us, then we'll uh, take that to our leadership team. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And a comment from Brian Porteous. Moderator Brian Porteous. Uh, 276. As a former reader and one of those in Fife involved in developing and delivering uh, lead, uh, training for uh, local worship leaders, I welcome Section 6 as amended and uh, its focus on the breadth of our ministries. As a former chair of Workplace Chaplaincy Scotland, I'm also grateful for mention elsewhere in the committee's report of the new development of Scottish workplace chaplaincy. And I want to pay tribute today to the work of Leslie Hamilton Messer and Rob Rawson in the national office in doing what they can to resurrect workplace chaplaincy as part of our ministries. I hope that I might be forgiven though, given my background in lamenting the fact that we've moved from 100 voluntary chaplains in the old system into 30 voluntary chaplains now. But like the convener, I move on uh, with optimism and uh, with help from the national office and the training team in Fife Presbytery, we are starting training new chaplains in the new system. And uh, we're happy to share that experience with any presbytery seeking to do the same. Of one thing I am certain, and that is that reaching out as a church, in the name of Christ, into the workplaces of our land where there are 2.6 million people is really important. As I ran for the train this morning in Cooper, I stuck my head round the Royal Mail Delivery Office uh, where I'm a chaplain to say hello. And I'm always welcome there. And the chaplains of our land are always welcome in the places into which they go because we're there to care to care when there's bereavement, to care when there's trouble, when there's industrial action, to care when there's suicides, and in lots of different circumstances. So, moderator, in our fire stations, in our delivery offices, in our supermarkets, in our dying high streets, these are all important places for us to be. And dare I suggest that this is an important form of ministry that might help us with the crisis of perceived uh, our, our perceived relevance in our communities. So, moderation, uh, moderator, alongside what we're doing in looking at readership and looking at local worship leaders, I would commend to the leadership team the importance of continuing to focus on workplace chaplaincy in this land. Thank you. Thank you. I have no other indications of people wishing to speak. Anything online, Sheila? No, um, convener. Moderator McNeil 454, I'd like to thank Brian for advance notice of him speaking to this, and we'll, we're only too pleased to accept uh, his uh, motion in terms of including workplace chaplaincy in terms of the list of those. It's a comment. Oh, it's just a comment. Uh -huh. oh, 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 that's fine. Okay. So, what do I, what do I mean to so it's the amended section six. To, okay. to, to, to close the debate before Thank it. you for your comment, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> but, but can, I, can I make the most of the opportunity to say... Is that a kiss for sure there? Yeah. It is, almost. <laughs> just, just to say that in, in my conversations with Brian, he said uh, five presbytery would be happy, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel to offer training to any other presbytery to help with workplace chaplaincy. Right. Thank you very much. Is it the mind of the Assembly that we accept the amended version of Section 6? and online. Thank you.
um, section seven. Accepted. I'm going line. Thank you. Uh, we come to section eight, and we've got an amendment. Um, Reverend Canon Professor Paul Middleton wishes to bring an amendment to section eight. Do you wish to read it, please, Clark? Thank you, moderator. This is an amendment in the name of Paul Middleton. Amend section eight by deleting the words and instruct the Faith Action Programme leadership team in consultation with the Theological Forum to explore theological perspectives on this issue. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Paul Middleton, 461. Um, I think there's a lot of important business today and I hope this doesn't take up much time because admittedly this is not the most important um, amendment in the world. And it might also appear uh, slightly uh, grumpy, um, but um, my diligence in reading assembly reports for the last 25 years has given me two pet hates. Uh, the first one is unnecessary biblical references and quotations in uh, reports, um, as, as if they're confetti. Um, it doesn't really help anything, but I'm not going to say any more about that. And <laughs> it's therapy. Um, and I, I'm sorry they're coming across as grumpy because really I do have a very sunny uh, disposition. <laughs> uh, but, but, this, but the second, the second is, um, is, is calls for kind of theological reports that are not in themselves kind of theological. Uh, of course, um, I, I read the, what the faculty had to say uh, on the minimum income guarantee. It was very short and it was very compelling. And I thought, yes, great, go for it. Um, and so I'm just wondering, actually, if there is any need uh, to instruct a uh, FAPL to, to contend with Theological Forum to uh, do some more work on this. Um, I am a member of Theological Forum, but I am speaking as an individual. Of course, there are things we can say about dignity and poverty and, and God's concern for justice, but perhaps no more than that. I should say that in removing the instruction, uh, this does not, of course, stop FAPL uh, from doing any further work on this, and I'm perfectly confident if there's any theology in it, the Theological Forum will be only too hard, uh, too pleased uh, to look at it. Uh, but I was persuaded by the force of the, the report that the minimum income guarantee is a great idea. Uh, so let's call for it and let's uh, just go for it. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else wishing, I suppose a seconder? Seconded, any discussion? on this before we come to uh, ask the committee to speak. No. I call on the Vice Convener. Moderator Emma Jackson, Vice Convener of Public Life and Social Justice. Thank you, Paul, for the amendment. Um, we would like to accept that. But I'm really actually really grateful for the opportunity for a few moments to talk about this really important topic. The minimum income guarantee is a big, bold idea. It's about reform to work, to social security, and the provision of essential services like childcare. But in essence, the minimum income guarantee is all about enough. And it all boils down to one very simple question. Do you believe, do we believe, that everybody should have enough to live a decent, dignified, and healthy life? We know that how and why poverty exists is complex, but it is overwhelmingly due to circumstances beyond any one individual's control. The biggest reason why people are pulled into and trapped in poverty are because of the broken structures and systems that exist in our society, systems and structures that are unjust. Social security systems that do not meet the needs of those who need a safety net. Unaffordable child and social care that are out of reach for far too many families low wages, precarious employment arrangements that make work hard, and a lack of suitable and affordable housing that means home is temporary for over 10,000 children in Scotland today. Insufficient income, rising prices. These are the injustices that push people into poverty and keep them trapped there. In 2014, the General Assembly affirmed the primary aim of the welfare system is to enhance human dignity for all so that every citizen may live a life to its fullness and to urge the consideration of welfare policy to be considered by fairness and compassion. If you know anyone who's in receipt of Social Security right now who has to battle with the DWP, I would highly doubt that they would use the words fair and compassionate to describe that situation. Poverty is not of the kingdom of God. 
The principle of everybody having enough is a key theme that runs throughout the entire Bible, from the Old Testament principle of jubilee and redistributing wealth and clearing debts, to gleaning where farmers left the edges of their field and harvested for those who didn't have enough. And when we look at the life and example of Jesus, we see not only his deep compassion and care for those on the margins, the ones that society forgot and kept trapped in poverty, but his manifesto for a better world, the ushering in of the kingdom of God, where prisoners are set free, where tables are overturned, the last are first, and something beautiful, something better is possible. And when I think about the promise of Jesus to, of life to the full, of abundance for all of us, where we are all fully beloved divine image bearers and in carrying inherent dignity and worth, that means that none of us should be forced to endure the circumstances that rob us of our dignity and wealth like poverty. Undoubtedly, there are different ways of ensuring everybody has enough, but the minimum income guarantee presents us with a once in a generation opportunity and policy solution to do this. And in a just and compassionate Scotland, as followers of Jesus, we should strive to do everything possible so that everyone not only has a sufficient income, but be able to have the opportunity to flourish. We've heard from the Vice Convener. I'm taking it that uh, the, the Convener's uh, happy to accept this. Um, is the Assembly happy to accept? And online? Thank you. Yeah, so that, that's Section 8 as amended, obviously. Uh, and I've been asked just to do it again and just state it's Section 8 as amended that we're agreeing as an Assembly and online. Right, thank you. Um, section 9, and I've got no, no, I haven't got a note of amendment. I've got speakers um, in Section 9. Um, firstly, I'd like to call for Ida Waddle and then Song Cook Park. Second, there you go, that's you on. You're on now. I'm on now. Ida Waddle, 527. Thank you, moderator, for an opportunity to make a comment. As a mission partner to Central Africa, and particularly to the United Church of Zambia, I'm delighted to see that the work of the Kirk's sister churches in Central Africa is deservedly being recognised. However, it is important that when the review of our international work and presence and the impact of the significant number of grants and funds to, war, to our partners take place, as mentioned in the Assembly Trustees' reports yesterday, we do not forget the valuable work and contribution made by the former World Mission Faith Impact, now Faith Action Programme. This, I feel, is not being adequately recognised in this report. The Great Commission does not just stop at Jerusalem, but should go to the ends of the earth. Currently, Zambia, Malawi, Zimbabwe and Mozambique are in the midst of a drought. The harvests have failed. We have chronic shortage of water to power electricity in Zambia. Currently, we have load shedding, 12 hours with no electricity in 24 hours. Water restrictions in Lusaka, the capital of Zambia. How do we run hospitals, schools, businesses with this situation? The church and government will work hand in hand over this famine. Our plea is that the Kirk continues to look outwards to the wider world. Yes, the Kirk has many problems, 
but please remain looking outward as well. It can, Kirk continues to make a valuable contribution as well. That too would help in sharing the gospel and extending the kingdom of God. Our partner church, the UCZ, greatly values the partnership. Thank you. Thank you. Anne Sunkook. Thank you. Thank you, moderator. Uh, this is Sungkook Park from the Presbyterian Church in the Republic of Korea, in short, PROK. Uh, the Church of Scotland has been a long trusted member, uh, partner of the Presbyterian Church in the Republic of Korea, and also a long standing member of the Ecumenical Forum for the Korean Peninsula, which thrives for peace and reconcil reconciliation and unification on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, this year marks the centennial celebration of the National Council of Korea, uh, uh, which is the secretariat for the EFK, which is convened also by the World Council of Churches. Uh, so uh, will it be possible, it is a kind and humble request, that maybe a line or some words mentioning that the Church of Scotland still holds its position with the Presbyterian churches in the Republic of Korea with the NCCK for peaceful unification in, uh, in the, on the Korean Peninsula. Being mindful of the Korean situation of increasing military expenses, for example, Japan doubled their military expenses, and continuing escalating military tensions around the Korean Peninsula, we think it is uh, imminent, it is very important that one of our trusted partners mentioned this in our official documents that it is a continuing, continuing uh, support and accompaniment for peace and reconciliation on the Korean Peninsula. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. A suggestion has come into my ear that you have a word with Ian Alexander and with the clerks, and perhaps we could draft an appropriate um, motion um, to sum up what, what you, were, you were saying uh, to put to, to the Assembly. Um, so we have no other indications to speak on Section um, 9. Um, is it the mind of the Assembly to accept um, Section 9? And online? Then we'll suspend, suspend business for 15 minutes. But before we do, the Convener Procedure Committee wishes just to say a, a, a brief comment. Moderator, Mr Fleming told us that the bookshop had sold out twice of the new Church Henry supplement. I'm delighted to say that new orders have arrived and are available in the Rainy Hall for purchase.